Uh, good evening, and welcome to our latest installment of the of theology on the air. This is Metropolitan Scalarius welcoming you this evening to discuss a very important topic. Uh, coming up later this month, I believe, is September the 15th, we have a very important feast day. And the feast day is called in the Western Church uh, the uh, exaltation of the Holy Cross. And in the Eastern Church, it's called the elevation of the Holy Cross. The importance of this particular feast is that Many uh, Christians outside of the liturgical church uh, or the universal Catholic church uh, have not been instructed in the importance of the cross on which Christ suffered and died for our, our salvation. Basically, people see the Holy Cross as an, instrument, as an instrument of torture. Uh, and we know the gruesome nature of the death that Christ suffered for us. But what we fail to realize is that uh, the cross on which Christ was crucified is also part of the salvation of Christianity. There is a very intrinsic salvific concept or component to the cross. Uh, the, and the history of the uh, Holy Cross uh, begins uh, about the year 326, when St. Helena, the mother of uh, Emperor Constantine the Great, uh, and remember, Constantine the Great was the emperor that declared that Christianity would become the uh, basic uh, the basic religion of the Roman Empire. And it was through his beneficence that the church came out of the catacombs and into the free world so that she could spread her joy in teaching worldwide. But St. Uh, Helena, she traveled to uh, Jerusalem, and she went to what we now know is called the... Uh, Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and there legend has it that uh, during her uh, her excavation, if you will, that she came across three crosses that had been buried on what we call Golgotha, and and but she was not able to distinguish which which was the cross on which Christ was uh, crucified, and so. Uh, Tradition tells us that they did different uh, tests, and one of the tests was that there was a woman who was stricken with a very serious de, uh, disease, and when she touched the cross on which the Savior had been crucified, she was miraculously healed. And so this is where we get the holiness of the cross, and liturgical Christians recognize the cross as uh, not as an instrument of death, but rather an instrument of life, and that, what, that and it shows the triumph of uh, God over Satan because he took an instrument that was meant for death of humanity, and he made it a pathway to eternal life. And so this is a very important feast. And, for instance, we, we have it that in the uh, Roman church, one of the things that they do to commemorate this is that, is that they have uh, a specific service. Uh, however, it does change if it falls on a Sunday. And in recognition of this, that they wear the uh, red vestments, which represents two things. It, re it represents the blood of Christ that was built on the cross, but it also represents the presence of the Holy Spirit. And in the lectionary of the Church of England and other Anglican churches, they also stipulate the wearing of red for what they call Holy Cross Day. Um, 
in the uh, Eastern Church, what we find is that it's a, it's a fast day where we fast from the eating of meat, uh, dairy products, and fish in, pre- in representation of the holiness of this date. But what is most important is the life-giving concept of this particular feast. And I know that I've had the experience when I've encountered people who are not uh, knowledgeable about the salvific nature of the cross, that one of the things that I've had people say to me when they've seen me wearing the cross with the corpus of Christ on it, and they ask me why I'm wearing it, they say, because, you know, Christ came down off the cross, so therefore the cross is is no longer a uh, instrument of death and Christ is overtaken, but without recognizing the holiness that also goes with this particular instrument. And this is why you will find that liturgical Christians, priests, bishops, and deacons in the Universal Catholic Church wear a cross with the corpus of Christ as part of their clerical vestiture. Unlike other uh, Christians who wear a cross that is devoid of the corpus of uh, Christ. And so this is just a brief background of, of the holiness of this particular feast, that we commemorate the cross. We also commemorate St. Helena, Constantine's mother, who went and found the cross, and that it that is supposedly that in Constantinople, uh, in Rome, and Jerusalem, and in Armenia, and some of the uh, east, uh, some of the, what we call the Oriental Church, which the uh, Ethiopian, the Eritrean, the uh, Indian Church, that they have uh, pieces of the of the uh, true cross. But having said that, now I'd like to invite our guest for this evening who will give us some more information about this particular piece. And we have from uh, uh, Toledo, Ohio, we have his eminem uh, Archbishop Mark Dowd. We have from Tallahassee, Florida, his grace, Bishop Anthony. We have from... Uh, Hampton, Virginia, uh, the Reverend Father Tom Gore of the Anglican Church, and from Washington, D.C., we have this eminence Arch- Archbishop Cyril Mark Bailey. And I would like at this time to call upon our eminent uh, Archbishop from uh, Toledo, Mark Darwin, to give us some thoughts on this particular piece. Uh, Mark Darwin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pollock, and good evening, everyone. Uh, when we consider the gradation uh, connected with the cross and how it has become a symbol of resurrection, uh, we are reminded of the prophecy of Simeon when Jesus was presented at the temple in Jerusalem, when Simeon prophesied, this child is set for the rise and fall of many in Israel and a sign of contradiction. And that contradiction is the cross. It's a a vertical uh, line ascending heavenward and a lateral line which bars ascending the vertical line. So we have the horizontal and the vertical and the bridge across that lateral line, that that horizontal line that prevents us from reaching God is nothing other than the body of Christ who submitted himself to every manner of degradation, pain, and suffering because he didn't want us to have to go through it. Um, The... The church took its sweet time to figure out the theological implications of it, and and, uh, part of it does hinge on the the venture of St. Helena into uh, uh, Jerusalem to locate the, the true cross 
and uh, to begin uh, the construction of churches uh, uh, over over the area where the cross was found. Uh, but it's not a case of uh, everything was was hunky dory after that because in the early seventh uh, century the Persians remember them the Medes the Persians they conquered Jerusalem and their king captured the true cross and took it back to Persia well then came Emperor Heraclius the second not to be confused with, with Hercules but Heraclius the second defeated the uh, Persian king whose name was was Khosrow, that's as close as I can come to pronouncing it. Uh, but Khosrow did not have things in order in his own household, and his own son entered into intrigues and had him assassinated a few years later. And so he decided to return the cross to Emperor Heraclius II. So in uh, 629, he initially, having taken the true cross to Constantinople, he decided that Jerusalem was really the place. And so tradition has said that he tried to carry the cross on his back. He was unable to enter the church due to unseen forces. Um, by that point, the... Uh, the patriarch of, of Jerusalem entered into the picture. His name was uh, Zacharias, and he saw the trouble and noticed that he was trying to enter the temple in kingly attire. And so he suggested him that if he took off his royal robes and crown and dressed instead like a penitent, that he would be able to carry the cross into the church. And as soon as the advice was taken, he uh, he was able to deliver the cross into the church. So that's a, that's an interesting uh, side story. But uh, it still took a, a quite a while for the theology connected with the cross to develop. I think initially everybody understood that it was through the tree that man fell from grace, the fruit of the tree. And it's through the fruit of an entirely different tree that we are restored to grace, back to as good or new condition. Um, and, of course, God regards both the, the trees bearing fruit and the, the tree of uh, sacrifice uh, in the same way. They are the same substance. Uh, it doesn't matter that one has an edible fruit and the other one had the, the, the fruit of suffering placed upon it. The fruit of suffering ultimately becomes an edible fruit in our communion service where we receive the body and blood of Christ. Documenting that transformation is, of course, another evening's discussion. Uh, but uh, having uh, pointed out these things, I will uh, turn the uh, microphone over to another authority. I thank, thank you for you. your attention. Yeah. Thank you, Mark Dawa. That was very enlightening. And now we'll call on our bishop from Tallahassee, Florida, where the breeze is warm and the nights are quiet. Uh, Welcome, Bishop Anthony. Good evening to all of the uh, listeners on the air and all of my brothers uh, in the dialogue. Uh, what a wonderful uh, subject tonight, the, the cross, the exaltation of the cross, the elevation of the cross. As I had been talking to others earlier, and it's interesting that uh, these words, exaltation and elevation uh, I uh, because the significance uh, manifests itself in the uh, derivation of the words even uh, even though we are all uh, venerating the cross the cross 
um, uh, in St. Helena at the time that has already been uh, alluded to by our brothers in discussion, uh, there was actually an elevation that came about. Um, a temple was raised uh, uh, in that very uh, spot uh, where those uh, uh, crosses were identified, and it was, and actually uh, Constantine had built a, uh, a tomb. Uh, there was the tombs of uh, or some. They built the basilica there, the basilica of the Holy uh, Sepulchre, over over the tomb. So uh, this is during that excavation was when the uh, the discovery. It was discussed there with regards to which one of these crosses uh, was actually the one that uh, Jesus had died on. But the cross immediately became an object of veneration. And as we know now, on that Good Friday celebration in Jerusalem, especially toward the end of the fourth century, uh, there was even some eyewitnesses uh, to miraculous things occurring that took place uh, around uh, the cross. Uh, there are many stories told of uh, different uh, eyewitness experiences as it relates to the cross. Uh, the the entrance to uh, the emperor in Persia is another interesting uh, perspective, but at a different point in time. Uh, but the exaltation of the cross, of the Holy Cross, was still the center of uh, of attention. Uh, the cross today uh, is the universal image of Christian belief. Uh, we've had people alluding to the fact that uh, in clergy uh, we in many ways uh, carry our cross, uh, but countless generations of artists, we see pictures, art, uh, which has turned this cross into a thing of beauty. Uh, and uh, some carried in possession that even wears it as jewelry. Uh, but to the eyes of the Christian, uh, early on, the cross had no beauty. It, it stood outside the walls. It was decorated on it with the cane corpse. It was where people were, you know, sort of like the electric chair is today, uh, more of a threat to people uh, to include the Christians. But although um, when, now when b believers spoke of the cross, we now speak of it as an instrument of salvation. Uh, it's it, salvation and the cross is almost uttered in the same breath. How splendid the cross of Christ. Uh, it brings life, not death. Light, not darkness. Paradise, not lost. It is the wood in which the Lord, like a great warrior, was wounded in hands and feet and side, but healed thereby our wounds. It's a tree, and this tree now brings us life, as stated by the great theater of studios. Thank you, Mr. Anthony. We venerate uh, the cross and... How splendid, the cross of Christ. Indeed, it brings life. Well said, Bishop Anthony. Thank you for your contribution. I think you make a very important part about the construction of the Church of the Holy Sepulcher by St. Uh, Helena, which is something that where uh, Christians go to venerate the cross even to this day. Uh, I think that that's, that's really important. I thank you for that contribution. And now I'd like to turn to our uh, Anglican priest in residence in Hampton, Virginia, uh, Father Tom Gore. You have four minutes. Thank you. Thank you. I may not meet all four minutes. Um, the research I did, I found that it is a recognized holiday on our national calendar our religious calendar, uh, the exaltation of the cross, uh, has predominantly fallen among those who pray the daily hours. 
the liturgical prayers uh, on a daily basis typically used in the monastic orders. I have most of the Anglican priests that I personally know rarely mention the holiday or have services, but I've noticed that in the older Anglican orders, it was people were far more aware. Um, in current times, there are people that are constantly trying to re um, uh, embrace these ancient traditions and ancient services and worship because we've noticed a great deficit in spirituality in the church. So the information that I can offer is this, that for the biggest part, um, I think that the the recognition is more on a personal level or persons who have greater knowledge or education about the feast of the church. So in Anglicanism, I was not able to find a tremendous amount of information that would be outside of the uh, traditional Western church. And even most of my friends in the Roman Catholic Church have informed me that they never heard of the feast. So in Western church, I'm thinking it's something that's been really recognized over the years, I think since Reformation times in the West, that people back away from anything like this because of its Catholicity. And so I wish I could contribute more, and I wish I could be far more positive, but that's what I came up in my research. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Father Tom. That's, that's very interesting. Uh, I think that this particular feast is really interesting because we have to look at the fact is that, unfortunately, as you state, Father Tom, is that some Christians in, in certain liturgical churches are not uh, knowledgeable of this particular feast, but they uh, should be. And with that, we'll now turn to our eminent scholar in Washington, D.C., his eminence, Archbishop Cyril Mark Bailey, and he will give us some scriptural support for this. Welcome, uh, your uh, Arch Archbishop Cyril. Uh, good evening, Metropolitan, and to all of those who are in broadcast land. Uh, I would like to come out of um, the book of Corinthians, of both the first and, and second Corinthians. We are reminded uh, in the scriptures that the truth of the cross is a stumbling block to the Jews and to the foolishness to the Gentiles. St. Paul calls out in the epistle, he says, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Because the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And if we look at the, the readings for the Orthodox Church for the Sunday before the cross, the uh, example is put before us uh, of Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness, which is an archetype of the cross, a reference to a poisonous snake God sent to humble the Israelites as they began to forget his saving power. Mm -hmm. Moses prayed for God's mercy, and so God instructed him to make from copper the image of a serpent and lift it high on a pole so that anyone bit by the poisonous snake can look upon the snake and be healed. Isn't it wonderful that we can look upon the cross and who died on it, knowing that he healed us from all of this pain, from all of this shame? Um, so, uh, the, these these um, uh, analogies here are great uh, mysteries. As God will have it, the image of the cause of death became the remedy, uh, 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 really, for our, our death, which became eternal life. 
the Old Testament uh, points out uh, that, that uh, you know, the Messiah or the God-man or uh, Jesus uh, Christ, it, it, it points from the Old Testament all the way to his incarnate um, uh, uh, life that he defeated sin and death on the cross by what? His death. And so that great instrument of Roman death, the cross, is transformed like the snake into the greatest instrument of healing of all time, which is the remedy for death. For this reason, we speak of Christ's death on the cross as victory, the greatest victory ever. Christ entered death as a man and defeated it as a God. Being the giver and author of life, and for us ancient Christians, the cross is never understood apart from the larger picture of our salvation and of Christ, God's redemption of fallen mankind. And I'll stop right here, Metropolitan, and turn it back over to you. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, uh, Archbishop Cyril, that's really important what you say, is that when we look at the salvific nation notion of the uh, cross, is that image of uh, lifting up of the, uh, Moses, lifting up the uh, serpent in the wilderness, it reminds me of uh, several churches that I had that I visited, where they have the image of the ascending Christ uh, on uh, on the altar, and this and this shows the triumph of Christ over death, and and this is what's really important. And one of the images also is that during the time that St. Uh, Helena had gone to look for the cross is that one of the uh, traditions is that uh, that the uh, true cross was placed on the body of a dead person and they came to light. Because this is that gives it the uh, concept or the notion of the life-giving cross, which is, uh, in, which is in complete opposition to what most people think about the cross. They look at it as, they look at the cross as an end, where it was actually a beginning of what uh, uh, Christian, Christian life. And so I think that our purpose this evening is to do, as Bishop Anthony said, is to perform an act of exaltation of this holy instrument while at the same time elevating it so that the world becomes uh, knowledgeable of, what the, of how God took an instrument of torture and turned it into an instrument of salvation. And I think it's important why Christians wear the cross and why liturgical Christians do such uh, venerable acts such as kissing the cross. And so I'd like to offer each of our uh, panelists this evening two minutes to give some thoughts on the uh, wearing of the cross as a form of uh, venerating and elevating it. So we'll start with uh, our Archbishop in uh, Toledo, Ohio, Mark Gower. Well, yes, it, it, it's uh, always fascinating to meditate on these things um, because we do, we do assume the cross of Jesus uh, through our, our worship, through our practice of wearing crosses, on vestments uh, and in, in the form of jewelry and, and so on. And, and it brings the question up from the onlooker, why do Christians continue to look to the cross after his resurrection? And our Protestant brethren, uh, their crosses generally have no corpus on them. And so it is purely a emblem 
in, in the Protestant world, but I think Christ sort of answered that. If you recall in, in the Gospel of Luke, that wonderful verse, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So it's not only elevating the self, but it is, we are elevating ourselves onto the cross. We take it up, and we are crucified with Christ. And in the sacrament of the communion, we are united with Christ, having been nailed symbolically to the cross, dying unto ourselves, as Jesus says, deny himself. So we deny ourselves so that we might rise with Jesus as a second fruit of the resurrection. Thank you. Uh, Bishop Anthony, two minutes. Yes, yes. Uh, the uh, elevation of the cross is really the only sign worthy of our total allegiance and that our recognizes that our salvation comes not by <laughs> victories of any earthly son, but by the only true and lasting victory of the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. When we elevate the cross and bow down before it in veneration and worship to God, we proclaim that we belong to the kingdom, not of this world, and that our only true enduring citizenship is with the saints in the city of God. Amen. Uh, Father Tom. Yes, there's a passage of scripture that comes to mind, and every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I think when Paul uttered those words, he was impacting an idea that we're going to kneel before this crucified and risen Lord either in this time and walk with him into eternity or at the end of time and face him as a judge in eternity. And I think the one thing that has baffled me over the years is the debate about whether the corpus should be on the cross or not. And yet in my many, many studies of Eucharist, what we celebrate is not just a dead man on a cross. But we celebrate the power of dying with him and resurrecting with him and being fully united with him throughout all of timelessness. That as he lives, we live. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Archbishop Cyril Mark from Washington, D.C. Yes, We wear the cross with crucifix and icons not because of this ransom theory that says God being forced to pay a ransom to the devil for his son's blood to free mankind. No, that is not true. God did not have to have no ransom because he's the maker of everything. We wear our crosses with our crucifix to remind us, what did Jesus do for me? I I know that he probably done the same thing for all of you, but when I wear the cross, I can deeply reflect on his love for me. It was not a ransom from God at all. It was his divine grace. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, my brothers, for your very astute contributions this evening. In preparation for our departure, I'd like to point out that uh, that the Assyrian Church of the East who celebrates the binding of the Holy Cross on September 13th, considers this to be such a major feast that they also consider the sign of the cross, as we always see Catholics do, making the sign of the cross from their head to the chest, shoulder to shoulder, that this is an additional sacramental uh, action. 
So that in addition to all the other sacraments, that the sign of the cross itself, which is a form of life, is an, is an additional sacrament. And I hope that this evening we have helped our listeners to have a more venerable attitude and perspective on what the cross represents. And what the cross represents is life. We lift up the cross and we wear the cross with the corpus of Christ to understand that this symbolizes God's triumph over death. And as St. Paul tells us is that Satan no longer has any control over us because of the salvific nature of the Holy Cross. And so we'd like to thank you all for your participation this this evening. We hope that this is enlightening to our listeners, and we hope that you will come back and join us next month when we will have another installment. In the meantime, if you'd like to register a comment to us, please do drop us a line at domesticworship at gmail.com, domesticworship at gmail.com, because we would love to hear your thoughts and your suggestions on how we could make this a better program or maybe just how it has touched you. So this is Metropolitan Scholarity with all of his brothers saying good night and God bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.